Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eric Green, Program Director for SE Media, and welcome to the webcast sponsored by Cisco focused on endpoint devices, how to stop the primary point of entry. 70% of breaches start on endpoint devices. Unfortunately, gaps in protection exist when users and endpoints are off network, often leaving AV as the only form of protection. And reacting to malicious communications and code after attacks launch is simply too late. It's time to prevent, detect, and respond to attacks targeting endpoints both on and off your network before damage occurs. Today, you'll learn how you can not only stop attacks before they occur, but contain and remediate threats that evade frontline defenses anywhere your users travel. Please note that for the most ideal viewing resolution, you can download the slides by clicking the link in the lower left-hand corner of this uh, interface. Also, we'll leave time after the end of the presentation for questions, so please do feel free to type those into the webcast console. Also, if you'd like to revisit anything shared by today's featured experts, you can check out the full conference on demand on the SE Magazine website. So let me introduce our, our speakers all from Cisco, uh, Meg Diaz, the product, uh, product manager, Joe Malenfunk, who's another product manager, and Neil Patel, who's a technical engineer all from Cisco. With that, let me hand it off to you, Meg. Great. Thank you, Eric. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, so as Eric said, I'm, I'm Meg Diaz. Um, and so today, I'm going to kick things off and, and talk a bit about you know, what we've really been seeing out there around uh, breaches, uh, really beginning with in the end, on the endpoint. Uh, so as Eric had, had just mentioned, there is research that was done that found 70% of breaches start on endpoint devices. And they continue to really be the primary point of entry for attack. And if you start to think about why that is, it comes down to a few key things. So first, you know, just having gaps in protection. 65% of organizations say that attacks evaded existing preventative tools that they had, such as AV. Um, then there's also, you know, user error. And, and actually, I guess stepping back for a minute, if you think about AV is just not enough for a lot of the advanced attacks that are out there. And then you think about user error. 48% um, of attackers bypass endpoint defenses because of user error. And just, you know, the attackers are getting more sophisticated. They're, they're finding ways that make it really easy for your employees to continue to be fooled. And then the, the third piece is around, you know, just having gaps in visibility. Um, a lot of organizations, 55%, are unable to determine the actual cause of a breach. And it takes 100 days of the industry average to actually detect a breach has occurred. So that really comes down to a lot of times the fact that they don't have deep enough visibility into what's actually happening on those endpoints. And when you think about what you actually need to address this, right, so how do you better protect these endpoints, right? Organizations need visibility and contact and control. Um, so they need to make sure that they're protecting users against malicious, malicious files that they might be accidentally downloading or malicious files that might evade initial detect, uh, detection mechanisms. And then if you think about, you know, we're always out on the Internet browsing. So there's also the, the threat of Internet-based infections. So without the user even clicking on anything, there can be malware or other malicious files downloaded to those devices. And then once you have devices that are infected, that malware often is reaching back out to the attacker infrastructure through command and control callbacks. So how do you prevent it and contain that? Because once you're able to do that, that's really when you're able to stop that, that data exfiltration and potential encryption from things like ransomware. And that's really when you think about endpoint security, it's being able to cover across all of those different um, areas. And that's really, when, when we look at it from, a, from, from our perspective with, with Cisco, um, we're looking at it from a lot of different angles. And we have two main products, Umbrella and AMP for Endpoints, that are really helping provide organizations with very comprehensive coverage. And the way that, that we've had customers explain this to us, the way that they think about it, is that they see Umbrella as kind of the first line of defense, and then AMP for Endpoints becomes that last line of defense. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper into both of these and, and what they actually mean and, and what we mean by first and, and last line of defense. But at a high level, Umbrella is, is considered a secure Internet gateway. So it's all about making sure that 
anywhere your users are accessing the internet, they're protected, even when they're, they're off the VPN, making sure that they always have secure access to the internet. And that's really how you can kind of prevent a lot of those, those initial infections. And then there's actually AMP for endpoints for actually getting visibility into what's really happening on the device itself. You know, what, what, what malicious files are attempted to be downloaded or, you know, what files actually run on the machine and what are they actually doing. And it's by having the combination of these two technologies that really give you this, this very complete view and, and, and control of what's happening on endpoints. So now let's dig a little bit more into Umbrella first. So like I said, we look at Umbrella as, as kind of that first line of defense against threats on the Internet. Because what we're ultimately doing is seeing what the good and bad is across the Internet. So learning and getting the intelligence to see attacks that are even forming on the Internet. So as attackers are setting up Internet infrastructure, you know, web servers, dom uh, domains that they might use in attack, as they're do taking those actions, being able to see and, and learn about that and proactively prevent users from going there before an attack has even launched. And with Umbrella, you're able to actually get visibility into all of the Internet activity across your entire organization, whether it's a user that's you know, connecting from headquarters or a branch office or even you know, on, on a plane as they're connecting to the you know, FlyFi with JetBlue getting that visibility and, and protection everywhere. And ultimately, being able to stop threats before connections are even made. And now, kind of going into that a little bit further, how do we actually do that? Well, one of the, the, the core mechanisms that Umbrella uses is DNS, or the domain name system. And when you think about DNS is really a, a fundamental component of how the Internet works. Right? Any, it, it, it's the system that connects domain names like Cisco.com to IP addresses. And when you think about why DNS was initially developed, right, it's very similar to the reason why, you know, when I go to call a friend or a colleague, I'm going to go to my contact list on my phone and look up their name versus trying to memorize everyone's phone number. And DNS was developed for a very similar reason, that you don't have to remember the IP address for every single website that you want to visit. And with Umbrella, we're actually tying into DNS and using that as the, the main, the, the first mechanism and the way to get traffic to our cloud platform and, and then be able to enforce security at that same time. So when you think about it, every device in your network uses DNS. And we're basically, Umbrella is able to see all of those requests, those DNS requests that are coming out, and is then able to determine if somebody is trying to, to go to a malicious destination and then block that. So what you're ultimately able to do is that before somebody even gets to one of those bad sites where, you know, it could be a watering hole where something might be downloaded automatically, Umbrella is going to prevent them from going there in the first place. And that means that your, your existing security staff will end up seeing fewer infections, right? You're, you're going to be able to stop things at the very earliest point. And then if you have devices that come onto the network, Umbrella can also contain um, and, and stop those command and control callbacks so that you can make sure to, to prevent any data exfiltration that happens. And the great thing about DNS, and we'll, I'll show you this a little bit later um, in the, the demo section, um, is just how easy it is to provision globally. All you have to do is just make some network configurations, just change that DNS so that it's pointed to the Umbrella Global Network, and you can start protecting every device onto your network, which is huge for a lot of, of customers. It's actually that time to value and being able to get that protection so quickly. Now let's dig a little bit more into what, uh, you know, how it actually works. So anytime you click on a link or, or, or type a, a URL into your browser, that request is going to go to Umbrella. And if it's a, a safe request, then Umbrella is just going to send the IP address back and the user will connect as, as usual. Because we, um, Umbrella basically acts as a recursive DNS service for external DNS requests. And then if they're trying to go somewhere uh, to a malicious destination, we're going to send them the IP for our block page. So they'll go to our block page instead of uh, that bad site. And now there's also some domains out there that host both good and bad content. Like take reddit.com as, as one example, right? You think about there are some 
sites on Reddit where people are just having, you know, debates about which is better, Pepsi or Coke. But then you have other sites where they're actually, um, you know, there's actually malware that's being hosted. So for, for domains like Reddit, we're going to send that traffic to our cloud-based proxy for deeper inspection, where we're going to do URL and, and file inspection on that, uh, that site before we make a determination. Um, so that's an incredibly efficient way to, to do that because we're making the majority of the decisions at the, at, based on the, the domain. And now when you think about, you know, the, the good and, you know, what we determine is, is bad, right? How do we know that something is bad? We actually give you visibility into what we know. So we, you can actually get access to our threat intelligence through Umbrella Investigate. Um, so this basically gives you access through either a web-based console, which I'll show you in a little bit, and, um, or an API to be actually able to leverage our intelligence. So we're not just going to tell you that something's bad, but we're also going to show you what we know about it. So we'll be able to actually show you, you know, that we know that this domain is bad because it was, it's hosted on an IP address that, um, that a lot of other bad content, you know, it's hosted in a bad neighborhood. Um, maybe the person who registered the domain is, has registered a lot of other malicious domains. There's lots of different attributes that we're looking at, and you can see all of them and actually pivot around and check them out. Um, and what Investigate is also great for is, is incident response teams, right? So if you have, um, you know, an indicator of compromise, like a domain or a, an IP that you come across and you want to see what we know about it, you can use Investigate to, to do that and actually gain insight into, you know, what infrastructure an attacker has set up and will show you the relationship between them. So now that you have a, a little bit of a, a better understanding of Umbrella, I'm going to hand it over to Joe to give a little bit more detail on Ant Friend Points and, and how the two products can work together. Cool. Thanks, Meg. So, Basically, we've been talking a lot about all the outbound stuff that actually occurs, right? So Umbrella is really that first line of defense in terms of an outbound communication. Now, once malware, whether that's file-based or not, lands on an endpoint, then we need to actually end up protecting it, and that's where we have to come into our last line of defense. So AMP for Endpoints is a cloud-managed software as a service that runs as a connector on the endpoint. Umbrella doesn't require any presence on the endpoint. It's super easy to deploy. AMP for Endpoints ends up being that entire continuous monitoring, recording, investigation, and remediation tool um, for when something malicious does actually land at the endpoint. Now, the, the nice part about AMP for Endpoints is it's actually offered as both a public or a private cloud deployment. So if you're, uh, for instance, in a very uh, sensitive organization, whether that could be a, a defense contractor or banking that is strictly against using public cloud, uh, there is the option to do a private cloud. But what exactly is AMP for endpoints, right? We're providing three key pillars for endpoint security, and that's all around preventing attacks up front in real time. So that's blocking everything that we know that's malicious on the front end and making sure that uh, as little as possible gets through. Now, say, for instance, there is a zero day, right, something that no one has ever actually seen before. That's where AMP really comes into action because we're continuously monitoring all processes and all activity that's actually occurring on the endpoint. And if something like that does end up getting through, then the response functions within it are, are really all about digging into accelerating those investigations and making sure that the time to remediation is reduced down to as little as humanly possible. Because the most expensive part about remediation is having to pick up the phone and call the lawyers. So let's uh, double click on, on each one of these really quick I'm not going to spend too much time on them, but I do want to give you guys a sense of what exactly we're doing on both sides, right? So on one side, we've got Umbrella, like Meg said, you know, preventing all those malicious Internet requests. And on the other side with AMP, we're actually recording the activity on the endpoint. We use a, a host of, of actual inspection techniques to stop this stuff, and so I'm going to dig into a couple of those. And that includes, um, firstly, having the most amount of global threat intelligence possible to prevent all that stuff from occurring. You can only prevent the stuff that you actually know is malicious. Now, in some cases, uh, you can tap into third-party resources. In other cases, you can use threat intelligence that's built into your solution. So we have 
Uh, Talos is Cisco's security research division. There's uh, over 250 researchers who spend their, their days trolling the Internet, trying to find what are the current exploits that are being used out there, what vulnerabilities are being bought and sold. And they're putting all of that stuff into AMP at the front end. And interestingly, the statistic that I have up there is, is current. It's 45% of the detections didn't exist in virus total at the time that we make those detections. So almost half of our detections at the front end are net new, something that no one else in the world has ever actually seen before. So that's how we end up doing a lot of the blocking. A lot of the rest of it is um, we use a detection lattice. So it's, we're not relying on a single detection engine or prevention engine. So if you think 20 years ago, 10 years ago, all we really had was antivirus. Well, at this point, antivirus is pure signature-based stuff that we actually know about. Um, We've had to move beyond that. that. That's probably not a lot of net new information for anyone, but basically the way that we're looking at it is antivirus is really a checkbox. Um, you need to go beyond that. So what happens when you don't know about something, right? We use things like machine learning. Um, how do we actually use it? We take files that we've seen, we break it down into small pieces and look for components that may have existed in other pieces of malware that we may have seen. Um, we match those up and, and basically score a confidence level on, hey, we've actually seen something like this before. Think about a piece of polymorphic malware. It may just be repackaged. Um, it may be adapting to the actual environment it's in, or it may have a sleep timer built into it. And if we really don't know something, so think of a, a file attachment from if somebody's spoofing an email and sending it in with a file attachment. There's a lot of examples of this actually happening. Um, when we have something that we say, we've never seen this before, we have no idea what it is, we can actually run that into our sandbox, uh, which is a malware analysis engine built into AMP for endpoints. Now, none of these analysis techniques are done on the endpoint. That would just create a really bloated agent, um, things that nobody really wants anymore. So all of this analysis is actually done in the cloud. We leverage the power of the cloud because we can do a lot more analysis up there than you'd want to run on your laptop or desktop. One of the coolest features that we actually have built into the sandbox is in any given size of organization, you've got a standard image that you deploy across the board, right? Whether that's for Windows, Macs, whatever. And we know the various executables that are, that are going to be deployed there. If we notice that there is an executable that exists on 10 or less hosts, we will automatically send that into the sandbox for analysis. Fun fact, on average, 10% of those executables turn out to be malware. So it's really one of those proactive ways to, to harden your defenses. And so that's everything that's actually happening on the endpoint. But like Meg mentioned with Umbrella, the prevention component also comes down to preventing malicious connections to the domains and the URLs that are serving up a lot of this malware, um, serving up you know, whether that's file-born or not. And then lastly on the prevention side, we have to focus on one of the critical areas, which is patching, right? So because we have a presence on the endpoint, we can see all of the various uh, applications that are installed, and we can map those against the CVEs that are actually out there to say, hey, we know that your specific version of Chrome or Flash or Adobe um, has a known CVE. We'll prioritize that, and you can use that to actually go and patch right away or even prioritize your patching or automate it using your a patch management system if you're using it. So there's a lot of things that we do on the front end to make sure that um, systems stay as, as secure as humanly possible. But no prevention is actually 100% secure, right? There, there's no way anyone says that, yes, we prevent 100% of threats. It's a fallacy. That's why we need to constantly monitor and detect everything that's actually occurring, all of the file activity, all of the behavioral activity, whatever somebody's actually doing. And we do that um, by constantly monitoring processes, resources, activities. And on the umbrella side, we're actually stopping those command and control callbacks from occurring. So hypothetically, if there was a zero-day exploit that did begin to do outbound communications and communicating with a, a command and control server, we could shut down that communication with umbrella. On the AMP for endpoint side, this is um, where we really come into play to continuously analyze all that file activity and provide what's called retrospective alerting. So we're, we're watching everything, we're protecting everything, right? Now, there's two ways that we actually do that. First is with um, using the, the analysis on the actual endpoint itself, 
and then we can integrate with the other components of your security infrastructure to monitor activity happening there. So for example, if, uh, if you're using a Bluecoat Proxy SG or a Cisco Web Security Appliance, we can analyze the proxy logs that is actually uh, indicative of outbound traffic without actually decrypting the payload to find out, hey, is this actually normal communications? And really look at what is anomalous traffic and dig into it. That's one, another one of those machine, no, sorry, machine learning techniques that we use on the detection side for continuous monitoring. And then if we do catch something, the, this is where we go into response, right? When I said retrospective security, this is what it means. We're actually diving into it and saying, here's what happened, here's where it came in, here's what's being affected. So we can show the full history of a compromise, provide outbreak control, and more importantly, provide the context behind why something is malicious. That's a very important thing to answer is, why is this bad? But there's a few other key questions you need to answer, right? Which is, what happened? So what domains did it communicate with? Do we block those going forward? Where did the malware actually come from? What was the point of infection? Who was patient zero? Where is it actually propagated to? Do we know how many people are affected? And then what is it it's actually doing? Do we, can we actually scope out and say, what level of risk that we have, do we have there? And lastly, how do we stop it? Now, I guess at this point, it's probably important to say that historically, this has only been possible with, with mostly Windows uh, and Linux and standard PC operating systems. But as part of this, we want to tell you that there is just one more thing. And this is a very common line for anyone familiar with Apple. And Cisco Security Connector is the first ever security app for enterprise-owned iOS devices. And so what we're actually doing on Cisco Security Connector, which will be available at the end of November, so you guys are all getting a, a bit of a sneak preview into it, is providing visibility into actual iOS devices and providing a control through Umbrella. So we're able to, to stop if somebody's punching in um, a malicious domain by accident, right? Mistyped URLs. Additionally, what if somebody has sent a text message that might be a phishing link? How often, you know, you get a text message that says, hey, you want a cruise? Click on this link to go get it. Hey, great. I never registered for a cruise, but I'm, I want to get this cruise, so I'm going to go get it. Um, I think for most people on the call here, they wouldn't click through that, but that's because we're also security aware. Most users might actually do that. It's shocking, actually, the amount who do. So Cisco Security Connector is really built for enterprise-owned iOS devices. This means they're actually corporate-owned devices, not for the BYOD market. And it's deployed through your company MDM. Uh, right now it works with the Cisco Meraki solution. We do have a number of other MDMs that will be compatible with, uh, and we'll announce those at the time that it goes, uh, becomes generally available. And I do have to mention it is only for supervised devices or said differently for devices running in supervised mode. So if you do have a device that's your own and uses it for work and you're running your email on it, that's not what it's for. This is the equivalent to if a company issues you a laptop, but in this case they're now issuing you maybe an iPhone or an iPad, they're those devices that they are actually going to install applications on, they're going to be managing, that they actually own, that is part of their asset pool. So that's the Cisco Security Connector, and I think with that, it probably makes sense um, to give you guys a quick heads up on, you know, don't just take our word for it, right? We've got customers out there who, who surprisingly have actually stood up in front of a camera or have said, hey, I, this is a solution that we actually use. So AMP and Umbrella together provide that first line and last line of defense. And NHL University in the Netherlands has about 12,000 students and 1,200 staff, so a 10 to 1 ratio. And in the spring of 2016, right before their exams kicked off, they faced an onslaught of ransomware that was brought into the network by one of the students. Now, since they're primarily a BYOD solution, the, and the, the, the issued device, they issued their devices to teachers, they really needed that flexible way to support both, of the, both parties, right? Everyone that's actually going to be on their network they ended up deploying both Umbrella and AMP as a result of this ransomware attack, obviously realizing that they didn't have the right defenses in place. And since then, they haven't had a single ransomware instance. 
Now, we're going to send you the link in the follow-up email so that you can actually watch this case study. Um, they, were, they were pretty adamant about the solution they used and why they actually chose it. So if you think that's impressive, you know, take the time to go watch it on camera. They'll explain why. We'll drop that into the email as a follow-up. So without further ado, let's get on to um, actually taking a bit of a deeper look. So I'm going to turn it over to, back over actually to Meg, so you can take a look at uh, Umbrella. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Um, and just a reminder for everybody, um, you know, in terms of the, the viewing, so I'm going to walk through a few screenshots um, right now. And to get the best view of them, you can also download the deck. Um, so that I think in the lower left-hand corner, you should be able to see that. Um, so feel free to download and follow along as we go in case the, the resolution isn't as good. Um, so it looks like I just need control to be able to, to move the slides forward, which I don't have quite yet. Okay, perfect. So first I want to um, walk you through kind of from the end user perspective. So let's say I'm, you know, checking out my email and I see an email from Dave. And now I know Dave um, and, you know, it's one of the, the um, contractors that I, I work with and I see an email for a payment processing error, it's the third attempt, so that seems pretty important. So I, I uh, click into it and I see that they're unable to bill me for a, a software platform that I use. And so this looks legitimate, so I would go and I would click on, on that link. And then what happens is I get this block page from Umbrella. So that's really, you know, the end user experience is, is pretty straightforward for what they're, they're seeing. As soon as I click that link, that request went to Umbrella. It saw that I was trying to go to a malicious destination, and it returned me this, the, uh, the uh, block page instead. And what's great about this is that you can also use this as an opportunity to educate your end users too. So you can customize this block page that they see and even give them more information about, you know, what is phishing? Um, what should they be aware of? And, you know, give them the ability to learn more. But that's really the, the beauty of it from the, the end user perspective is, is you know, they're, if they were going someplace legitimate, they would go be connected straight there. So um, that's really great. And, and a lot of our customers also see an increase in Internet speeds when they're using Umbrella. And that's because we're one of the fastest recursive DNS services out there, plus we're adding security. So it's, it's one of those things that you wouldn't necessarily think that speed and security go together. But in the case of Umbrella, they, they actually do. So let's take a look at, uh, you know, actually setting this up on the, the back end. So this is the Umbrella dashboard. And so, you know, this is just going to give you kind of a basic overview of, of what you have actually deployed right now, you know, the, the networks that you have set up, the roaming clients, um, and so on. And you can get a sense for what kind of trends are you seeing across your environment in terms of block requests and, and overall Internet activity. One of the first things that you would do is actually set up a, a network and, and configure that. So let's say if I go into the, the Networks tab, I want to set up that identity. And I would come in here and I want to set up a Miami office. So I would come in here, I would, you know, give the network a name, I would put in the IP address, and, you know, if I want to get daily stats, I could, I could include my email in there too. And then once you click Save, that means your network is then configured. So now what happens is then you would go to your, your DNS servers or, you know, DHCP servers, wherever you have it configured where to point your DNS, you would go and you would change that to the umbrella IP addresses. So there are two IP addresses that we have that you would change in there. And once you do that, then all that traffic will go to umbrella and we'll know that which office or which network it's coming from, and we'll know that it belongs to you, and then we can apply the right policy to that based on what you set up. Now, today I'm not going to go into the details of, um, of, the, of the policies, but we do have you know, other weekly demos if you want a little bit more detail on that. But the bottom line is that it's incredibly easy to, to set up and get started. Once you do that, once you make that configuration change, every device, that comes onto your network is now going to be protected, including BYOD devices and uh, even IoT devices. If you have thermostats that are, are connected to the network, that uh, they can also be protected. 
Same with you know, guest Wi-Fi networks you can also protect. And then, so we talked about uh, deploying it for your network, but then also for roaming computers, you have the option, you know, because you want to make sure that those devices, wherever they go, they're protected. And so we have a couple of options for that. If you use Cisco AnyConnect today for, as a VPN, then we have a module that can be enabled on that. It's called the Roaming Security Module. And basically, it, it means that you don't have to deploy another agent onto those devices. Um, now, if you, if you don't use any connection, you still want to protect those roaming devices, then we have um, another, what we call a roaming client, um, that can be deployed on those devices, so on, on Windows and, and Mac uh, uh, OS X. And really what that's doing is it, it's simply redirecting the DNS. So it's just ensuring that no matter what network you connect to, those DNS requests are still going to Umbrella. So it's very, very simple and straightforward. So now you have things set up, right? You have your network configured, you have your roaming clients configured. Let's check out some of the, the reports and what you can actually see with Umbrella and what it's really catching. So what we're looking at right now is the, the security activity report. And basically this is showing you all the security activity that Umbrella is blocking. You can go to other reports and see things like if you wanted to, you know, just get insight to other types of internet activity or if you needed to dig into something for incident response, you can get a complete view. This, this one in particular is looking just at the security activity. And so we can see you can, um, you know, change, change the configuration depending on what you want to look at. You can see just the trending report. Or if you wanted to dig deeper um, into the event type. So this is showing uh, Cisco AMP event type. And you know how I had talked about the, the proxy, the intelligent proxy capability of Umbrella, right, where we will, for those uh, risky domains like reddit.com, we're going to send it to our cloud-based proxy for deeper inspection. One of the, when we're looking at the files, we're going to be checking that against uh, Cisco AMP to see if, if those file hashes are known to be malicious. Or, you know, if you're trying to download a, a file, it will check the file hash. So with this particular example, this is showing that AMP had, um, that we identified a particular file that was blocked. So you can get basic information here about, you know, what was the destination that the, that the person was trying to go to, who was the person that was trying to do that, what, what that, that site or, or that, uh, that file categorized as. In this case, it was categorized as, as malware. Um, and then you can see the, the URL and, and so on. You can see the, the SHA-256 hash. And so you get some, some good information here. But then you can also go a step further and pivot into investigate by clicking there. And what that's going to do is give you, like I said, even more information about what we know about that particular file. So this is pulling in information directly from Cisco ThreatGrid. So that, that sandboxing technology is bringing that directly into Investigate. So you can see from that particular file hash what we know about it. So you can see all of the behavioral indicators and the severity that's associated with it. You can see um, any network connections that that file is making, um, and then also any other associated samples and artifacts, too. So you, that's kind of pulling together, you know, what other things do, are associated with this? What else do we know about this particular um, uh, uh, artifact? Now, going back to Umbrella, um, you know, I mentioned that you can look at, at other activities, right? So this is another report that we have. Um, that's called the activity search. And this is where, you know, kind of similar to, you know, the, the, the menu on, on Amazon.com, you can, you can very easily toggle to, to select what view you want to see. So let's say with this one, I want to see everything that's been blocked over the past 24 hours with Umbrella, and I want to see it for, you know, my roaming computers, and I want to see any malware or phishing. And this will be essentially the, the view that you would see. You would see everything that Umbrella is blocking. Now, if we want to dig into one in particular, we see here um, somebody was going to um, binarycousins.com. And so when you, if you click on that, you'll get the destination view. So this is basically showing you what we know about this particular destination. And we can see that this domain in particular is actually associated with Locky ransomware. And what you're seeing with this graph here is you're actually seeing the number of requests 
across your organization, that umbrella is block it. Now you can also, if you were to click global traffic, um, that would show you what percentage of global traffic is being seen by your organization. And what's great about that is that that can actually give you insight into whether you are being targeted. So if you had a particular domain that accounted for where your organization accounted for 90 or 95 percent of the traffic that we were seeing globally, then that's probably a targeted attack. So it's great to kind of get that view based on all of the other Internet activity that, that we're seeing across our global user base. Now for this one, let's again check out Investigate and see what else we know about this particular domain. So this will pivot us over to Investigate, where you can see um, for this particular domain, it's currently on the umbrella block list. So you'll get up here kind of a, a highlight or summary of, of all of the, um, the core alerts. Um, you can also see all of the DNS uh, queries that we're seeing globally for this particular domain. So you can see it's been consistent around 10,000 10, um, requests coming in every day. And then there, you, know, you can also see spikes. So this can also, this is great because it can even give you insight into, you know, if there was all of a sudden no traffic going to a domain and then a sudden spike. You can actually see when that, that happened. The next thing down that, that we see is the who is record data. So that's where you're actually going to see um, who actually registered this domain. And so you can see who registered it, uh, what email address was used to register it. And now what you might be thinking is, you know, well, why would somebody actually use their email, their email address to register it? And one of the things that we found is that attackers don't always remember to change that information, right? So um, they actually do tend to sometimes use similar information or, or sometimes uh, you can make correlations to, to what they're, um, they're using. But in any case, you can actually see, investigate will correlate for you if that same email address has been used to register any other domain. And you can pivot on that and see um, what other domains it registered and if any of those were malicious. Going a little bit further down, you can also see for that, um, that uh, domain if there were any malware or there were any files that were found to be reaching out to that domain, which we can see here there's, there's a malicious file that was found to be associated with this domain. Um, and then the last piece that I'm going to mention here is um, around the timeline. So we can actually show you when this domain was categorized as malware and then when it was actually um, associated with, with Locky ransomware. Um, so we can actually show you a timeline of, of when that happened and, and when we uncovered it. Uh, now there's a ton of other insight that you can get from Investigate, but, and, and you can really see you have the ability to, to pivot around and look at you know, the IP address that this domain is hosted on and what other domains are hosted on that IP or ASN. Um, and so there's a lot that you can do to really build out this view of the infrastructure that an attacker is using. Um, but we don't have time to, to get into that today. Um, so for now, I'm going to turn it back over. Hopefully that gives you a, a good view of, of Umbrella's capabilities. And now we're going to dig into the AMP for Endpoint capabilities, and, and I'm going to turn it over to Neil to walk through that. Great. Thank you, Meg. So as we kind of go shift gears a little bit into the AMP for Endpoints piece, um, like Joe and Meg had said, we're talking about the last line of defense here, right? So we've got all of this, um, you know, first line of defense protection with Umbrella, um, all of the DNS layer kind of covered. Um, AMP takes into account stuff as it exists on the endpoint, right? So what we're looking at here is just the first high-level overview of the dashboard. So the kind of power of AMP here is having extreme visibility and control at an endpoint level. So you can get notifications and you can see, you know, files as they're being quarantined live on the endpoint, but you also see everything in a centralized dashboard at the AMP for Endpoints console. The console is designed very much around a incident responder kind of workflow. The initial dashboard gives you a health status of your environment. So you can see here a 4.5% compromise level, meaning of the entire organization or deployment, we have a certain number of endpoints that are compromised. We have details about each one of those compromised endpoints and events associated with that compromise. Other statistics around things like dynamic analysis, 
number of files that we've actually seen across your network, number of files that have um, made network communications outbound, all of those network communications, things like that. So this is just a, a very high level over, and we'll tie back into this at the end of the kind of workflow and demo that I show you. But we, we start off with um, the prevention part of this, uh, the product, right, and the prevention part of the, the security scope. Um, Joe mentioned things like vulnerability analysis. So the way AMP for Endpoints handles that is since it sits at an endpoint level, it sees executions, it sees creations, it sees copies of all files on disk, we can actually run analysis against those actual executables. So executables associated with specific versions of Java, specific versions of Acrobat Reader, specific versions of Firefox. We can see all of those versions, we can understand what version it is, and we can associate vulnerabilities with those versions. And we can see how prolific those vulnerabilities are across the uh, network or across the computer base by listing here in the middle column where you see it has either one endpoint or two endpoints affected, it could be more. And you can see the last time it was observed, so which computer observed it last. So this is this piece of information you can use to augment security, posture to augment you know, IT workflows or admin workflows, whatever else. It's just a way to ensure that the network or the endpoint deployment is not vulnerable to common exploits which are associated with stuff that's easy to patch, right? You know, just update Java or update Firefox. Um, and you won't have to worry about a whole slew of, of attacks coming in. Another bit of the prevention piece is uh, what we call our point in time detections, right? So um, these are all the things that are kind of like table stakes. Uh, the detection engines which operate at a point in time, uh, right as the file enters or right as the file is created on the desktop, we can do certain things with it to ensure it, you know, we, to ensure its either validity or its malicious intent. So the first of these um, in both, on all of our, our deployments, whether it's Windows, Mac OS, Linux, is a offline um, database or offline engine for uh, malware signatures. So, you know, just like any other AV engine for Windows, we use Tetra as the, as the uh, engine. For Mac OS and Linux, it's Clam AV with a curated signature set. Now that cur these curated signature sets, whether it's for Tetra or Clam AV, they all come from our Talos Intelligence Organization. So that's one of the pieces that Joe had mentioned earlier on in the presentation, that dedicated group of engineers that is constantly doing research um, analysis and figuring out new malware, things like that. So that's where the curated signature set get comes from. Other bits of detection that we can actually do are also two, two other modes. The first of these is Ethos. So this is a... Um, it's a fingerprinting engine. Uh, we call it a fuzzy fingerprinting engine. And the idea behind it is this one-to-many matching. The simplest way to explain it is something along the lines of the company you keep. So, you know, if you are a single file that we don't know about or we haven't seen, but every file that is moderately associated with the contents of your file are malicious or have had malicious intent or have been exploited, <clears throat> we make a decision or we make a determination on the, you know, um, security posture of your file, and that file would become malicious. It would be, you know, if the company you kept was malicious, we're going to mark it as malicious. So that's the idea behind Ethos. It's like a, a loose fingerprint of a file, and we can compare it to many different instances of other files that are in other malware families to see if it's related. The other engine is a machine learning based engine, which is Spiro. Now this works on uh, Microsoft PE, so our portable executables. Uh, the way it works is it actually extracts a large number, close to 400 different characteristics out of the executable itself. Things like the PE headers, things like um, referred DLLs, uh, interactions it's having with system files, um, even things like the common, uh, common object file format, the cost. So we take all of these parameters and we feed them into big data analytics. We take information out of it and we make a determination on the behavior, based on the behavior we see in this file, whether or not it is malicious or it is clean. So these are some of the um, point in time detections that we do just, you know, we're talking about as a file writes to disk. Once the file is there on the, on the disk, what can we do with it before we even let it start, you know, running amok on the endpoint or flying, you know, free? So the other piece of this um, is outbreak control. So not only do we have these signature sets and these detection methods that are curated by, you know, highly qualified intelligence engineers, all the folks at Talos, all of that, 
we have the ability for you as a security operator, an IT manager, whoever else, to write your own detections and blacklists and whitelists for files, processes, and um, IPs at the policy level. So we have, and I'll go into the details of each one of these, but we have things like custom, simple custom detections, um, advanced custom detections, application blacklisting, application whitelisting, and then also network IT blacklisting and um, whitelisting. So what is a custom detection list, right? So simple custom detection list is just that. It's very simple. It is a, again, one-to-one -one match. We're looking for the calculated SHA-256 of a file. And if that file matches the criteria, meaning is it this file, yes, no, we're going to take the corresponding action to that custom detection list. So if we add a file into a simple custom detection list by its SHA-256, we can block on it operationally without having to worry about, will I miss it? Will I catch it? It will automatically be on this blacklist. So advanced custom detections are a little bit more involved. Um, these are all written and built around a CLAM AV signature framework. So it gives you extreme control if you are so inclined to write your own malware or virus signatures to append to the database that we already use, meaning we'll actually run files against this custom um, signature set. The way it's done is actually very easy. We create a new signature set. We can build a signature set based on a list of signatures. So if we have you know, a set of signatures that we use in IT practice or an organization uses in IT practice, you can enter those signatures as part of a single detection and then build the database from that file. Um, the example that I show here is very straightforward. It's a simple detection um, written in a um, CLAM AV format. We have an MD5 of the file, the file name, and then just the detection name for it. So this is just a very simple um, signature set, uh, but you can get as advanced and as uh, complicated as, as you want. You know, CLAM AV signatures can be written based on um, SHAs, based on MD5s, based on sections of the PE, based on the body of the, um, of the executable or the binary. So you can do very different variations in terms of how you write these signatures, and they can be as complex or as simple as you want. So another, another piece of this kind of um, advanced outbreak control and detection system is IOCs. So how, how do we write or how do we determine how, you know, a malicious action on an endpoint? The IOCs, they are, M M for endpoints already has a curated set, again, of IOCs. All these features you're seeing augment what is already built. So what you have here is the ability to identify your own indicator of compromise, a way to say, if I see an endpoint exhibit this behavior, I want to make sure I indicate on it. I want to do a, you know, I want to flag. And these IOC scans are run on demand or on schedule. So the way endpoint IOCs are written is very straightforward. It's open IOC format, and it's in an XML. So what you have is you have the ability to formulate what criteria with, you know, standard logic and or operators determine the um, indicator on the endpoint. So you can write, you know, you can create a large endpoint IOC file. You can upload it in here, and you can make sure that any endpoint that exhibits behavior that is marked by the contents of the IOC will flag at the endpoint's console, and you can take action on it from there. So these are all things that kind of, you know, what I'm talking about are all these things that help us prevent and detect all this malware. So we classify, you know, we're not just relying on something as simple or as basic as, hey, does it match a signature? No? Okay, let it go. There's all these other extra pieces that make sure that we are doing everything possible to prevent and detect before we start having malware run rampant in the environment. Um, another one of these big pieces is the low prevalence feature. So this is, again, what we talked about a little earlier today, um, the ability to identify endpoints that exist in small numbers across your network, right? If you think about this feature, it's very powerful in what it does. You can't have, you know, no, one, no, no IT department or no organization is going to have the ability to go in and monitor every file um, that executed on endpoints and see which ones, you know, are low prevalent, you know. It's obvious that you know 90% of machines in a corporate environment are going to execute Chrome.exe or WinWord.exe. But what about those you know four or five endpoints that um, execute you know ShadySoftware.exe? 
you know, you're not going to be able to identify that until after the execution has happened, and then it's going to start running rampant. And maybe it's you know a long term, um, maybe it's a long term uh, piece of malware that's just you know going to wait for a while and then start infecting. So prevalence, low prevalence, will pick up that file, and what we can have it do is automatically send that file up for analysis. So what we're saying here is this file has gotten into the computer, onto the endpoint. So it's passed all of these, you know, checks that we've talked about, that we've, we've looked at, and we don't have a disposition. We're not sure what this file is, uh, but it does exist in low prevalence, so there's potential for malicious intent. We take that file, we ship it off to our dynamic analysis engine um, that, again, Joe talked about in Threadgrid. Um, to do that analysis in the cloud, we do, you know, we, we run it in a, in a closed environment, we take the data out of it, we generate a report which says this file has a score of 0 to 100, and you can see a couple examples here. And when that score returns, if we determine that it is malicious, we can actually go back in a retrospective alert and do quarantine on the endpoint right there. So this prevents, you know, you know, we get an alert when the quarantine happens, but it's something that would have never been picked up otherwise, right? How would you have ever seen that file execute if you didn't have some mechanism like this to monitor, pull, and quarantine? So that's a part of that retrospection that happens. Another element in terms of um, kind of that prevention and detection phase is giving you a split of the threat root cause. So this is actually a very powerful tool to understand what is your biggest sort, your pain point? What is the biggest process that is launching malware? So is there something that, you know, you need to either decide, well, this process that we have or this software is always the one downloading malware. Maybe we ban it across the computer base. Maybe we make sure that users can't install it. Or maybe we just block that file altogether, that process altogether, however you want to approach it. But it gives you a very good, you know, report view or starting point for attacking, you know, what is the biggest cause of concern on my endpoints? What is the process that's doing the most damage? So moving beyond just all the prevention and detection stuff, what about the real meat? You know, again, like Joe said, there is never going to be a time where we can say we are going to protect 100% of detections out the gate or uh, malware out the gate. We're going to be able to see everything right before it gets in and done. You don't have to worry about anything else. That's, that's impossible. And the security world is a fallacy. So when, when a file does get in and it starts acting maliciously, how quickly can we go and understand the scope of what that file is doing? So the first thing is we have this tool in Amphire Points is file trajectory. So the great part about this is it's a one-stop shop for files, meaning I click on a file or I type in the SHA-256 of a file and I immediately know exactly which endpoints it has touched and on those endpoints what it has executed, the parent and child process for it. So if you look at this little screenshot, you can see that this, this file exists on one endpoint in the demo environment, but it has done X number of things over a period of time. It was parented by explorer.exe, meaning the file came from, you know, file explorer. Someone executed it from file explorer. So that gives you a very quick insight into everywhere the file has been and at a high level what it has done, right, what it has interacted with. Now, if you want to go even deeper, you have the ability to actually turn back the clock on this endpoint. Because what we see here is we know what the file has done, but we don't know really where it came from. So with device trajectory in AMP for endpoints, we can actually turn back the clock. We can take it back a few notches. Now that we know, because we were alerted by the you know, malicious intent of this file, we know that this endpoint is compromised, we can actually go through the process of very quickly identifying what started this whole chain? What created this exploit, right? So it's a little tough to see in this, but I wanted to give you a holistic view of what the device trajectory would look like. It's essentially a map of file processes to events. So a process, when it made a network communication outbound, whether it dropped another file, so on and so forth. So what does this look like in real time? This gives you the ability with something like device trajectory to move quickly from a response phase to a protect phase. So if we look at this workflow very carefully, you can see we have a process iExplorer.exe, um, meaning our um, Internet Explorer browser, seems to have dropped a file called monkeys1.zip. And then after that process completed, we started seeing the execution of monkeys.shockwaves.exe, which was highlighted in red the malicious process. 
So we know that a, a compressed zip file is being downloaded from the web. That is what's getting extracted by explorer.exe and then creating that shockwave element that has the malicious intent. What we can do here is we can actually very quickly say, all right, well, we already know since we identified that the shockwave.exe is malicious, we can qu it's quarantined by AMP, but we can also quarantine that original zip file, the SHA-256 of that zip, with a simple right-click block, right? So now we have the ability to go directly from, hey, this endpoint um, had malware to blocking the source of the malware. And then when you do that simple custom detection list on that SHA, that's policy-wide. So if you know user B tries to go tomorrow because this was like an email chain that went around and says, oh man, I need to see monkeys in a shockwave format, if they try to click it, done. And then one last piece before I wrap up for Q&A, um, the dashboard elements, once you finish that process, we also give you the ability to take endpoints and move them from a infected or requires attention state to a resolved state so you know where you are in the workflow if there's a lot of events coming in. So with that, Thank you guys very much. I'm going to hand it back over to the organizers here, and we're going to go through some Q&A. Very good. Thank you all for uh, some great information. Um, we do have a bunch of questions here, so um, I'm going to get started, and we'll knock off as uh, many as we can in the time we have. So um, I'll let you all decide uh, who's going to hit these. Uh, each first question, um, where is the data of the continuous monitoring stored? Yeah, so since I'm already kind of talking, um, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, data of the continuous monitoring and AMP for endpoints, all of that log information is stored in the cloud. So that file trajectory and continuous monitoring is a 30-day rolling window. That window can vary a little bit depending on the volume of events that come in, but all of that information as it happens is sent in small bits up to the cloud, and we correlate and we collect all that information there in the console. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, next question for you guys. Uh, what is the bandwidth requirement for AMP, and is the traffic encrypted as it talks to the cloud? Yep. I'm going to continue on with the last statement there. So the bandwidth is very limited. It's small bits of data as it goes up. All of the communication is over 443 TLS channel, so it is encrypted as it sends it up. Sensitive bits of information that are up in the cloud, they require two-factor authentication to access, so there is that other layer of security when accessing the details as well. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. So let's, uh, let's see. We probably have time for a couple more here. Um, so a question, uh, can, we, can we set up, someone wants to set up a, dam, a demo amp uh, in their company to see Umbrella in action? So the question is, I guess, can they do it and what can they do to do it? Yes, absolutely. So um, some links that we have there. So if you do want to try it out on the Umbrella side, if you go to signup.umbrella.com, you can sign up for a free trial that way and, and get started. Um, or if you want to work through your, your partner or your Cisco rep, you can do that as well. And then on the AMP side, we have another link there, bssco slash tryamp, that will take you to more information. Outstanding. Thank you. Another question. We already have AMP on our email gateway. Does AMP for endpoints work with that? Can you, can so I'll take that one. So, so. Yep, so the, the question was around um, uh, AMP uh, and AMP on the email gateway. So AMP as a technology is universal. The concepts of SHA lookup and detection are, are universal on the platforms. However, the two products do live individually. So if you have AMP on the email gateway, you will be seeing your malware detections based on files that come in as a part of email. Um, if you have AMP at endpoints, that sits in, in its console, and it's all about files that sit at the um, endpoint level. So two different platforms. Um, we are pretty close to um, integrating at least the event-based or event-driven data into the AMP Cloud Console, um, but they are still two individual products and offerings. Great. And we have time for one more question here. Um, so the question is, how uh, are Umbrella and AMP licensed? So I'll take on the Umbrella side. So Umbrella, uh, we have a number of different packages that are, are available depending on the functionality that you want, and the majority of them are based on the number of users that you have, so the number of Internet-connected users, however many people in the organization are using the Internet. 
And on the AMP side, it's on uh, the number of devices. So we actually install a connector on the device, so you pay per connector. Excellent. Well, thank you, guys. So that, that's all the time we do uh, have uh, for questions today. If you have any questions about today's presentation, uh, please visit the SD Magazine website so you can see the full conference on demand, the recording and the like is there. And you can also contact uh, the speakers there with any further questions. Um, any questions that we are unable to answer, you'll be contacted directly uh, if you haven't been already by, uh, by email from, from the speakers. Meantime, I'd like to extend my appreciation to Meg, Joe, and Neil for sharing their expertise and insight. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Absolutely. And thanks, Thank you. of course. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Great. Thanks, guys. And thanks, of course, to, to our sponsor, Cisco, um, and to all of you for both spending some time with us today and so many really uh, fantastic, thoughtful questions. Everyone have a great rest of your day.